Hello, everybody. Sorry, I am new to this StreamYard <laughs> and YouTube combo. Um, I am Nora Burnett Abrams. I want to welcome you all to, for and thank you for joining us today uh, for what will be an incredibly lively and um, meaningful conversation between artist Nari Ward and curator Gary Carrion Moriari. They will be discussing the exhibition. Nary Ward, We the People, which is currently on view at MCA Denver through September 20th. If you enjoy today's program, um, I encourage you to come back <laughs> later this month when we kick off um, additional programming inspired by this exhibition. Um, the first one is titled, um, it, it will be a bi-weekly program titled Hyphen American, um, a conversation series focusing on immigration and representation in American media. Um, and then on Thursday, August 20th, Neri will be returning uh, to join us again for a conversation with Sir David Ajay, the architect of MCA Denver's uh, building. So you can find out more about programs, uh, these programs and others by visiting our website, mcadenver.org slash events. And without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Neri Ward to our virtual stage. Uh, Neri was born in 1963 in St. Andrew, Jamaica, and he currently lives and works in New York. He is known for his sculptural installations that are composed of discarded materials found and collected primarily in his neighborhood. He has repurposed objects such as baby strollers, shopping carts, bottles, doors, television sets, cash registers, and shoelaces, among many other materials. He recontextualizes these found objects in thought-provoking juxtapositions that ultimately create complex metaphorical meanings to confront social and political issues surrounding race, poverty, and consumer culture. He intentionally leaves the meaning of his works open, allowing viewers to provide our own interpretation. Neri, thank you so much for being here today. And of course, thank you so much for sharing your work with uh, the city of Denver right now. Uh, next, I wanna introduce the curator of this exhibition, Gary Carrion Moriari, who is the Krauss family curator at the New Museum in New York. Since he joined the staff of the New Museum in 2010, he has co-curated monographic exhibitions of a number of artists, including Hans Hacke, Neri Ward, John Comfra, Raymond Pettibone, Natalie Gerberg, Ellen Gallagher, Jim Shaw, and many others. He's also co-curated group exhibitions, including the 2018 Museum Triennial, excuse me, New Museum Triennial, Songs for Sabotage. I wanna welcome Gary to our virtual stage. And again, I wanna thank you both so much for taking time to share um, the history of this project, um, your practice, and uh, without further ado, I turn it over to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. Um, and welcome everyone here to this um, unusual, but I think a very um, happy a conversation on the occasion of Neri's exhibition traveling to the MTA Denver. Um, as Nora mentioned, this is, you know, of course, very unusual circumstances. Um, you know, we've been working on, Neri and I have been working together on the show for quite some time now. Um, and after the new museum, it traveled to Houston and now Denver. And this is by far the most, un you know, the most unusual installation process and opening process that we've experienced. But, you know, I think all of us at the new museum are grateful to all of the efforts that everybody involved, um, Neri, of course, but Nora and her entire team, um, 
put into making this happen. Um, you know, Neri, maybe just to start, um, uh, if we could pull up the first slide, um, I think we'll have people joining us, I'm sure from Denver and from elsewhere, um, just to get to set the scene a little bit for um, what this exhibition actually looks like. Um, I'm sure this is, you know, typically when you're installing an exhibition, you know, it's, uh, you are one of the most hands-on artists I know in terms of installing their, their work. Um, this was a pretty unusual uh, set of circumstances that to be installing an exhibition. And can you talk a little bit about maybe just, you know, how it felt to kind of install an exhibition virtually, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, what kinds of, um, you know, how you sort of compromises and, and challenges that presented in, in doing to doing an exhibition, which, of course, we're, we're um, excited to, to for the people of Denver to experience. But um, of course, yeah. we're not actually able to see right now. So. I mean, we had the benefit. The good thing was we had the benefit of doing it twice, right? We did it in the museum and then at, at Houston. So um, we kind of knew a team. Um, and I, I would, I just wanted to give a shout out to uh, Stephen Rose, who's a friend and, and uh, my sometimes assistant. I always call my sometimes assistant because he's got his own practice. That really guided, the, uh, helped guide this along. Um, so we had all our, our um, information in place. But ultimately, it comes down to trust, you know, and really trusting the team, uh, Nora's team there, and they did an amazing job. And it, there wasn't a lot of compromise. And in fact, there, um, there were some misinterpretations that actually worked out for the better about that. So it, um, things evolved in the work itself. Um, so it's it was a it was an amazing. One that I was anxious initially about, as you can imagine, because I, I really want to be hands on about the work and, you know, it's always been. Um, but at least now I know when I'm no longer, you know, of this earth, something can happen. You know, people will be able to install the work in, in a, on a high level. A, a lot of work, we had enough force thought to have a kind of video manual. Um, so, for instance, Amazing Grace, we had a video manual for its installation. Even We the People is a very specific kind of um, directions for uh, how to install it. So that that's really you know, work um, together. Um, yeah, I, I think that that certainly having you know the years of expertise that you and Stephen have brought to installing these pieces, you know, um, and the amount of people that you've you know, brought into that process over the years. Um, maybe Sarah, if you could go to the first, the first, the next slide. Um, so this is Amazing Grace. Um, one of the pieces, if you're in Denver, you'll be able to see this piece installed in the show. I think, you know, for us at the New Museum and for me as a curator, it's one of the most important sculptures that was made anywhere in, in the 90s um, and a real, you know, I think um, still one of the most kind of moving pieces of, of um, art as an installation that you can experience. This is um, the work installed in Harlem in 1993. And um, I'm sure for you, this, you know, the piece is sort of um, evolved and changed over the years. I've seen it in many iterations in response to the architecture in a really dynamic way. Um, maybe just to go back to the beginning, let's, if you want to talk a little bit about the circumstances of um, installing that work in Harlem and, you know, for you, I think, you know, how even the meaning of that work has changed over the years. You've been always, you know, open to these kinds of interpretation, you know, misinterpretation in the installation of the work, but also the meaning of the work has, you know, has changed as this, you know, the social and political circumstances of where it's been displayed have changed. Can you just talk, give us maybe a little bit of history behind the piece? So when the, the piece was initially created, I, I was an artist in residence um, at the Studio Museum in Harlem. And, and it was actually out of that residency program that I started collecting the baby strollers because I, I had the uh, space on 125th Street. And so there was just a lot, you know, again, different era, different time in the 90s. And uh, I really wanted to, to find a way to talk to the community. The idea was always initially to show the work uh, within Harlem and it was about this particular community. And I wanted to talk about a, a sort of crisis of the community, but also about uh, potentiality. Because for me, that's what was so crucial about these baby strollers. One, they were discarded. They were discarded, uh, you know, found dis uh, baby strollers. But that, for me, they also re represented a one, the, the very moment that the child leaves the body and is pushed, literally pushed into the world. So there was a, 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 this idea of potentiality in them, inherent in them, um, but also the fact that they were, uh, they, they were in such disrepair was, uh, for me, very intriguing uh, kind of conf conflation that I, that I wanted to, to figure out how to negotiate. And the idea, like all of my work, was just if I collect enough of them, 
the work will tell me what it needs. And so I decided early on that I was just going to collect 365 for each day of the year. And it, it took me around, I think it was around maybe three months, you know, pretty much on a regular basis, a little less um, to, um, to go and to, to sort of collect all of them. So that, and, and the work kind of really guided me um, along. I had no, it, from step to step, like I really didn't have a space in mind. Once I collected as many as I could and the Studio Museum folks, staff got very anxious about my mental situation. I mean, for good reason, because they were like, well, where is he going to show this? What is this? What is he doing? He's just coming in and collecting baby strollers. So, that, you know, so they asked me, they had a meeting, you know, we had a meeting and they were like, well, what are you going to do? You know, there's not enough room. And they were, they were right. And so I had to go out and find a space. And initially I always wanted, I wanted to find a church. And that was my way, again, of recentering it from being about a kind of destitute space to maybe a, a space of faith and potential because I grew up as a Baptist. And so I wanted to sort of um, reference that connection. And I couldn't find a church, but then I found this firehouse, which is actually where I'm standing right now as we're doing this talk. I'm in my studio, which is probably somewhere in the middle of this bundle. <laughs> but um, this is yeah, so strange. So that kind of guided me to being in this space. And um, the space became a really important space for me in terms of other works, but also constructing the, the form. You know, it's a long space. Uh, it allowed me to do uh, the form that I wanted, which was uh, a kind of vaginal form. And, and people always, you know, see it as this boat. And that was, that was okay, you know, and they referenced right away slavery, but it wasn't necessarily about that. It was really about this, the, the, the passage from child to, from, from infant, newborn child to adult. Uh, and being in the world. I mean, that was my space, but I'm, I'm excited for all the other um, conclusions that came about. Like you said, leaving the narrative as open-ended is, and as weighed, uh, formally weighed as possible is, is way, for me, the way to bring the viewer in and engage your own imagination. Yeah, I think, you know, one important part, component of the work that, you know, obviously people can't see right now is the soundtrack, which is Mahalia Jackson singing Amazing Grace. And I think for, you know, a lot of people, that has conveyed a sense of the work as kind of a memorial. And I think that's a really, um, you know, um, to who is, you know, is maybe the more open-ended um, bit. But I think that um, that um, the, the kind of the emotional space that's created in this work, in this work through the use of object and sound is such a, I think, distinctive part of, of what you do. Um, can you talk a little bit maybe about the kind of almost the theatrical space or the, you know, the, the, the the yeah. drama that you've tried to build into something like that? The, the, um, that's, the sound component was actually the last uh, element to, to um, that was a, a moment of crisis in a way, because while, while I was building this in the space and figuring out what it needed and sort of having this conversation with the material, it really started getting heavy and for me started to feel very dark. Uh, and I didn't really want it to, you know, I might have wanted it to start there, but I didn't want it to end there, right? I mean, the idea was to, to have this, um, have these works evolve into something else and transform into something else. So while I was working on it, I remember thinking about, um, my father used to play Mahalia Jackson quite a, a lot in the household, and he would always play Amazing Grace, and I remember that feeling he gave me, that feeling of empowerment, um, that sort of spiritual uplift, and I, and, and, and the fact that this song is a narrative about being found um, about um, the person who wrote was talking about their own transformation, a slave, slave catcher, right, and uh, mm -hmm. slave trader, and he. It, it, it's a song about his his evolution, his uh, evolution as a human being. So I thought that was a perfect uh, piece to it. And, and one little anecdote I always like to throw in, which is the moment. So I already decided, okay, I'm, Mahalia Jackson's um, Amazing Grace will be part of this. And it really complemented and brought it back into another more uplifting space. And the thing that really guided me, but I, you know, when I was working on a piece, that um, a, a little moment of serendipity, you know, across the street from the building, the, the, the firehouse that I live in, is a school, and and I always knew this PS one twenty three one two three, and and at the, the very week that I decided I wanted the sound to be Mahalia Jackson's Amazing Grace. I remember walking around to the other side of the building because I was working here all the time and I didn't get a chance to move the neighborhood much. But that one day I went around to the front of the building of the school 
and realized that PS123 was called the Mahalia Jackson School. And that was, uh, that was like that moment where you're like, you know, you feel like you're being guided. So that was a really powerful um, uh, sort of presence for me. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, a, it's a, I'm sure everybody who sees it is gonna be blown away as well. Maybe Sarah, can you go to the next slide? You can see another, this is a later iteration in 2013 actually at the new museum um, in the a show we did there in our space next door. Um, and maybe to the next slide. Um, that, so, that, that, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, sorry. You know, that iteration uh, at the new museum was actually the iteration that maybe the second time that it's shown in, in New York. And so, you know, it had gone, it, it, prior to New York, it, it had been in Europe and in different venues. And first, bringing it back to New York and what that means, right? Because and it makes sense. And I forgot from the Bowery, you know, and being in that neighborhood, that neighborhood um, that is so charged in its own way, um, it really made sense. Uh, and it was on a grand floor, so it was a really um, apt sort of presentation I was really excited about. It, it, it's referencing um, that community in the, in the, in the new museum. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, part of our, our kind of um, excitement about doing a sh the show with you at the new museum and which is now travel around is also, you know, um, the way that your work speaks to New York specifically at different moments in time and how as these, as, as these pieces have transformed, obviously the city, you know, both Harlem, your immediate community, but the city as a whole has changed you know, quite dramatically. So um, Sarah, actually, if you go to the next one, this is a piece that's not in um, the show, uh, the traveling show, but this is a piece called Hunger Cradle um, that uh, was also installed in the firehouse originally, um, also you know, traveled the world a bit and then came back to New York with um, We the People's you know, opening at the new museum. Um, and this, you know, what I love about this piece, this idea about, about um, something being found and something being transformed, which, you know, you speak about in relationship to Amazing Grace, you know, that's especially true in a piece like Hunger Cradle, where the piece is literally collecting objects wherever it goes. Um, um, you know, what, what was, how, is, how has the, the journey of that piece um, uh, been? And, you know, um, uh, how, you know how, how do you think about that in relationship to, you know, um, the firehouse changing and Harlem changing? Yeah, so, um... This was actually the the upper floor of the um, the first floor that you saw the the, the amazing grace. Uh, this is the second floor, and it's, it's the life of this building because the building was so many. You know, it was a piano moving company. It was a firehouse, a piano moving company. So you see all these ropes that were there, and I basically collected um, all the things that were left behind. And my idea was to take them all off the ground and find a way to connect all of them. And I had just did a residency um, with the Shakers in Sabbath Day Lake, Maine, where I did this, uh, this bottle curtain piece where I basically um, quilted bottles together with yarn. And, and my idea was I could make this, this um, yarn that would encompass the room and, and, and quilt all of these objects together. So the, the, the webbing is really about this Two, two, two aspirations in the piece was to, to bring things off the ground, sort of this idea of weightlessness, but also to interconnect everything. Uh, so you touch one area and the other area, which is like, like a regular uh, spider web. And so this was pre-assistance, you know, Gary, this is pre-assistant <laughs> mode. So I must have been there like 12 hour days, um, maybe you're at three or four weeks in the firehouse doing this. And it was really just, being in this mental space, like taking me, the work was taking me into a mental space of, uh, of creating this nesting for the piece. Um, and it just kind of evolved out of it. The title is really crucial. You know, it's, it's the, the idea of hunger uh, and cradle, right? Hunger is, is about consumption and desire maybe, and, and cradling is about um, maybe curing and protecting. And so uh, both of those words in one title was really, really important. You know, and so, and, and one little anecdote, you know, as you know, I, I, I kind of um, was pushing for Hunger Cradle to be the title of my uh, show at the New Museum. I'm glad Massimiliano uh, <laughs> said, listen, that, and he said it really wonderfully. You know, he said, you know, I think it's a nice title, but it's sort of something you see in, in, a, in a foreign movie, that, that title, you know, and I think, you know, we the people was much better, and he was right on, you know, he was right on, and I, and I trusted him in that, and, I, and it worked out. Um, so I, I love it. Uh, 
it wouldn't have worked well for it's a little too depressing for uh the title of the show well especially when you see we the people look so so you know um stunning on the facade of the mc denver i think it i think we made the right yeah. choice in the end for sure Trust, man. Trust um, folks. <laughs> well if sorry if you can move on to the next slide you know i think one of the kind of tensions in your work that we tried to get at in the show, which I think also translates really beautifully in Denver, is you know both the sense of a kind of rootedness in the community and attentiveness to you know the the, um, the material history of the community, but also like this idea that um, you know a neighborhood like Harlem, or you know if you think about a country like America more generally, you know the you know um, the history of slavery or just the diaspora experience more generally is is a foundational element of of what it means to be somebody living in Harlem or living in New York or living in this country. So, you know, at the same time you're making Amazing Grace and Hunger Cradle, you also were making an, another incredible piece that, you know, is really, I think was a, a surprise to a lot of people in New York, this piece Exodus, which you made for the Venice Biennale in 1993. Um, uh, you know, where did this piece evolve out of, you know, this idea of Exodus and, and you know, um, you know, what kind of material and social connections were you trying to get at with this piece? Yeah, so I, I, you know, in, in a lot of these empty lots in Harlem, I would see entire histories of people, albums, um, per, so many personal memorabilia is that photographs that were just discarded, you know, just kind of left and, and abandoned. And, and, and the key thing was, and, and this is the big distinction for me, it, they weren't just thrown, it wasn't like I picked them up roadside and got there before the garbage truck. It wasn't that. Like a lot of the, 99% of these things were in empty lots or on the sidewalk by a building. And so there was um, this found dialogue that set up, found meaning it triggered a story for me. And, and so the fact that they were in these empty lots, and I think this emptiness around the, the object was really important. Um, this the sense of, uh, of this kind of, um, you know, almost, need you know like it, it there was this thing so for instance there the the albums the photos i would find uh three or four of them photo albums in the space in, a, in an empty lot you know i think something about that empty space around it triggered me to want to find a space for it where it might belong and so all these things i started collecting and i, I and the idea was they needed a powerful vessel to hold them so at the time i was working with this fire hose and I started constructing these um, these packages and bundles with um, with the fire hose. And the, the the way I made these was actually I, I took cardboard boxes, wrapped them with the fire hose, and constructed the shape. And then I was able to bring them into an empty lot and burn out the cardboard. And so I had basically an empty charred form. And then I would put the objects into them. And and I just did. I just kept doing enough of them. You know, there, there must have been close to 70 or 80 of them in this particular um, uh, installation. So they, they were the first things that I had. And then after I decided I needed to find uh, a destination for them or a forum, a forum for them to live in as, as, a, as an art experience, an aesthetic experience, as a formal experience. And the mandala form that you see, the round form, is actually the skin of the fire hose because it has two layers. And I, and I kind of wrung the, the, the skin or wrung the fire hose to give it a kind of uh, energy and presence. Uh, so it was like these things are dormant and still, and this thing had all this energy that uh, it was conjuring them. And that's kind of the way I, was, I sort of saw it as almost like this congregation. Um, and and the, the viewer, the witness to this as a, as a viewer coming in was somewhere in between that conversation. Similar to Amazing Grace, the idea is there are these bundles that are tied and, and kind of knotted, uh, rung with fire hose in the middle. And then the, at the edge, there are these kind of uh, singular baby strollers that are sort of watching the situation. And you as a viewer walk in between both of those things. And that space, you know, for the viewer to have to deal with the witnessing of this um, this theater it was, was really important because then you have to decide what role you want to play in in the narrative itself. So I, I was just, I mean, that was very theatrical and setting up uh, the narrative for you to figure out where you want it to go. Right. I mean, were you also, you know, um, 
I mean, how did you feel about having a quite a different audience? I mean, you were you were a, a very young artist at that time. You know, you had had a, a project at the New Museum. You you know, you had um, amazing grace. People, you got people to come up to Harlem to probably to you know a part of the neighborhood that they typically wouldn't have gone to. You know, what was the experience of you know working in Venice? And you know, um, um, you know, were you anxious about that different kind of international audience, or um, you know, what was the what was the experience of like entering the international stage? I guess for the first time, what was that like? I think it was it was exhilarating, um, but it, you know it wasn't so intimidating because in all of these works, Amazing Grace and Exodus, the idea was I created the space with the with the objects. Like so, I would challenge the architecture, um, or have these be a kind of stand-in to the architecture where the viewer had to navigate the, um, the space themselves, and they had to figure out how to get around things to get to things. So um, I could create. Uh, that play of the narrative in any space based on uh, the fact that these things kind of created their own history and you sort of abstract with history. So, it, I mean, the one really engaged, interesting thing for me talking about history being in Venice was that sense of uh, time, right? You know, you're because it was in the um, the aperto section, and that's a very I mean, it's a very visually rich section, you know, that uh, the Rome factory. And so I, I was intimidated by that uh, dialogue because it, a lot of my almost my work is about material, right? It's about the texture of materials and the, the presence of materials. And so you had this this space that had this sort of rich uh, presence. Um, that was the thing that was. But then again, you know, you light it and you make it work, you know, like focus the, the, the viewer's attention on, on the things you want him to see. So it, it worked out. But that component is something I'm always learning. And you learn, you know, from each new journey of the work in different contexts and having that challenge, I think you, 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 as, a, as an artist, I learn a lot about what can uh, be applied to it. Yeah. Well, this was... Um... Matter of fact, Gary, one quick... Sorry, one quick uh, sort of misinterpretation, you know, from day one, um, Miss Grace, uh, um, Exodus rather, as as always had this mandala form sort of lay on the ground. Um, it, it sort of rests on the ground like a wheel. And, and I, you know, in my mind, that's always I'm, my notion. I'm a sculptor and that's that's where sculpture belongs. And and Stephen, I, I don't know if it's Steve, yeah, Stephen made a miscue and at, at the MCA in Denver, he had it raised up like eight inches on the wall. And, you know, of course we had time to fix it, but I was like, oh my God, that should have been done. <laughs> beginning so because what it did it was it, like the whole thing moved like the whole thing felt like anticipatory yeah. like it, the, you know like this mandala became that much more energized and they became that much more uh sort of uh dormant so it was kind of exciting to see that that miscue yeah it's a, a, a beautiful thing with so many of your pieces is the way that they you know continue to live and and evolve and you know that openness i think is what makes your work really special um, and it was super exciting for us, you know, I've only, I'd only seen this work in pictures before to actually, you know, when you're in the space of the piece, and I hope, you know, as many of you can see the installation in Denver as possible, um, you know, it's also, it's, you know, it's not just about this particular image, like there is a presence that these pieces have, you know, because of the lighting, but also because of the, like, the smell of the pieces, like these pieces have like, you know, they have an organic quality that is like so alive and so, um, so moving, I think it's really interesting to see. Um, if Sarah, can you move on to the next piece? Uh, we're going to jump forward just a couple of years. Um, Iron Heaven. This is another piece that you know has had different iterations. You know, response to the architecture in different ways. Um, and there's you know a lot of things I love about this piece is you know the the um, uh, obviously the, the the histories of the materials that you're using. In this case, like cooking trays and charred baseball bats that are you know adorned with little um, bits of cotton and uh, and kind of sugar um but also the different kinds of forms that it takes so so you know when we were working on the show i you know had been thinking a lot about your work in relationship to you know um your connection to painting of like you know given the people that you studied with in new york at the time you know when we talked with um with you know uh oakley you know your your late friend and a, a great colleague of ours about this piece you know to him as soon as he said he looks at looked at this and saw it as an altar like you know it was like a, a shrine like you know immediately i um, mean i don't know if necessarily that wasn't you know a, a sort of um uh you know a, a thinking that you had when you were making the piece um 
maybe let's just start a little bit with, um, you know, let's say the, the, the form itself and this, the use of the base, the charred baseball bats, because this is also, I think, a really key um, uh, kind of trope you're using early in your career with, with this kind of transformation of materials. Yeah, I, because, you know, I was doing all this burning with the, with the fire um, host piece, the Exodus piece. Uh, the idea of changing the surface, of, of giving it a, almost a kind of anonymous presence, right? That like the fire is ubiquitous, um, was really important. Um, and then the idea also of figuring a way to make it become about a ritual of healing. So what I would do is, I, uh, in this particular piece, I would char the bats and then I had these um, cotton, sterilized cotton, med sort of medicinal cotton. And then I would dip them into tropical fantasy soda. And that's the piece that people don't realize. That, that's the magic. The magic is the tropical fantasy mm -hmm. soda. And then, uh, and then iron the edges of these pendants, which are cotton pendants. And when they dried, they became literally that pendants. And then I would nail them onto the, the bats. And, and I only chose, you know, the, the three main... Um, Tropical fantasy sodas were the red, white, and blue, which you can't see now. In the original iteration, there was more of this red presence of red, white, and blue on on the bats. Um, now it's kind of gone, you know. And 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 at the same time, I didn't want to be overtly um, symbolic, right? You know, so it's it's almost like how to take the symbolism and making it mine, and bringing the viewer on another kind of um, path or another kind of trajectory with the thing they think they know, right? And so once I had these bats and I was working on them, I, I, my, the question was, where do they live? How do they, you know, how do they engage with the wall, the floor? And at the same time, I was thinking about these oven pan um, that had these patterns of what I call night skies. And for me, I started thinking about this time, kind of quilted space of the uh, sort of putting the oven pans up to think about it as a, a kind of heavens. And the sky, the star, thinking about it as being more also about loss. Uh, and, you know, because I remember in grade school, the teacher talked about by the time the light from a star reaches the Earth, planet Earth, you know, th those stars no longer exist. And I've always seen stars in a different way. And so the combination of violence, which the bats represented for me, and loss made total sense. And so the, the, the piece kind of became one, you know, like I said, I was working on this different uh, separate pieces initially, and it made sense in that respect. And Oakley was right. There was this kind of uh, element of ritual, but also element of, um, you know, the, the idea of an altar being about control, trying to control these, the forces that you may, may not feel like you have control over. So there's something about this idea of violence and and a kind of um, American violence, maybe, that I, I wanted to bring into the conversation of the piece. Um, uh, you know what I also, you know what love, I also about love about this piece is that uh, there's a kind of, um, you mentioned the kind of symbolism of this material that's kind of coded and hidden within that, um, you know, within, a, I think, a quite beautiful formal composition. Um, if we move, jump on ahead, we're going to jump much further into the present. This is a piece, Ground Progress, from 2015. Again, you know, this, you know, recalls the language of, you know, uh, of minimal sculpture, of, um, you know, um, the patterns of quilting, but it's rooted in very specific um, uh, iconography that, you know, connects to the, his the history of this country and, the, you know, the painful history of this country um, in a really, I think, beautiful way. Um, you want to tell, give us a little background on the story about Ground and Progress? And, and you know, I, I really wanted to take these, um, th these are the quilt patterns from, um, the sort of underground railroad, right? And and I was really intrigued with the this code and how, how this code was is an American, is an it's kind of an American language, not just a African American, a sort of American language. And I wanted to figure out how to bring it back into a contemporary dialogue, right? Because people see it and they just think Americana and kind of place it back into a history. But I wanted to say how can I take that history and make it as present as possible? So ground in progress and that's important, this idea of ground, grounding, the grounding, right? I mean, there's, this is copper, and the copper for me was a material that talks about healing, and some cultures um, use copper as a metaphor for healing the body. And I got intrigued with that as well, the same with the, 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 the cotton, um, and sort of how this could be 
continued. And so the idea was to um, find a, a space for the body. Initially, when I did the piece, you could walk on top of it and you know, enter this, uh, this language, and you were part of the language. Uh, and I even had, uh, at the gallery, we even had uh, a programming around dance program that happened uh, one evening for, for people engaged with um, the piece. So that, that was really as simple as that. It's like bringing these, uh, this system back, this language, this code back, and having it become uh, a conversation of the present moment. Right, yeah, and how that... And minimalism was really... Thank you. Um, you, know, you froze there for a second. But um, you know, I, th I think it, the way that that kind of history has an impact on the present and on the bodies of the present, I think, is really, really powerful. Um, there's... So if you go to the next slide, Sarah, um, Spellbound, which I think is one of the most beautiful works in the show. Neri disappeared for a moment. I hope hopefully we'll, we'll get him back here in a second. Um, uh, if you, um, so this is a, another um, really beautiful piece that I made um, during, um, oh, sorry, welcome back. Yeah, yeah, sorry, uh, I'm sad. So, you know, I think that kind of like the, the you know, um, I was just saying a little bit about how, you know, we, we were, that history that's contained in that piece, you know, it continues to impact us, you know, um, and our, this country in a really amazing way. And I think Spellbound also speaks to that work. This piece you did um, in Savannah, where you, um, you know, are, are are finding these kind of um, uh, this kind of like hidden history within architecture, but also within the lives of the people that you encountered. Um, um, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, how you approach this piece? Um, you know, the experience of meeting people like. Um, um, this um, kind of wonderful man you met in the park in Savannah um, in the video on the right. Yeah, so th this is, a, you know, I'm always trying to challenge my, um, I guess, find ways to challenge my approach. And so the idea was, could I have a, a sculptural intervention and a video as a conversation about the similar journey? And this was my visit to Savannah, this, this rich history of American oppression in a way. Um, and so I really wanted to figure out how to um, to take it from there, but also have it become about possibility and potentiality and not, I don't want to have it get weighed down into, uh, you know, a, a kind of negative space. Right. So this gentleman, just so happened that, uh, this gentleman was selling these palms. I, I saw him weaving these uh, palms that he was making and he was singing this beautiful voice and he's singing so he became like the sort of lead character, almost like the the, the journeyman for the viewer in in the video, and uh, and his voice just sort of echoes within within the space. So, you know, that's the thing. You go on these these projects, you're not sure where uh, the work takes you, but you just have to be open to it. And so that I was I was fortunate to to sort of, and he was actually right next to that rock. You see that rock on the right, which is actually a, a kind of a a, a marker for I believe a, a Native American um, sort of uh, grave site. So I, I, you know, all of these different histories were in conversation at the moment and I, I wanted this piano, keyed piano to, to be the kind of anchor for those kinds of uh, conversations. Yeah, and another really beautiful part of the video is visiting um, the church, uh, um, the historic church, um, uh, you know, founded by freed slaves, where you know the the floor of the church has this pattern of breathing holes, and actually, you can see in your background one of the breathing panels right behind you, um, which is another, I think, real highlight of the show. And that's it's amazing, amazing to see in your work how you know these kinds of images you know generate different kinds of work over time, and how you can kind of um, um, they can spring off into different directions. Um, uh, how have the breathing panels you know been? Um, uh, how have they been sort of evolving in the last couple of years in terms of where you started with that image and, and the kind of materials and choices you've made in terms of the, the surfaces? Yeah, so you're, you're right on because that the video, this is the first moment in this video in this piece where the breathing panels show up because I, because I tried, I was trying to figure a way to record that history of the church, this first African Baptist church in Savannah, Georgia, uh, was a side of the Underground Railroad and the series of holes that were drilled into the floor had this pattern, which is, uh, you know, this, which were breathing holes for enslaved people who were trying to escape to go north. And they, the research is that they were also uh, a cosmogram coming from uh, the Congo, Congolese cosmogram that represented sort of the life cycle, you know, life, death, rebirth, you know. And so 
the idea that they were cr creating this this uh, code in plain sight was really another kind of uh, draw for it. And my challenge was how to make it present, how to make it you know part of the contemporary dialogue. And so I decided to use the copper, this heal material of healing, as the the vehicle for that conversation. And and literally, I just the, the thing was just like the ground in progress. The idea was to bring the body back into the dialogue. So I literally would walk on top of the copper and, and mark it with the patina from the sole of my, my shoes. And um, that became a way of sort of connecting it to the present, the, the viewer's uh, moment that they're experiencing the work. Yeah, and I think some of the more recent ones that are, you know, that you've been making even since the show, or the new museum opened, the ones where you're, you know, using images of, of handcuffs and things like that, that, you know, it's another, I think, attempt to right. kind of connect that history to the present. Um, yeah, that was really um, finding a way to, to talk about the present moment, you know, like what other objects, what other materials can trigger the imagination of the viewer. And so talking about those are much more a conversation about like mass incarceration. And especially because the work is talking about freedom, right? And and the yeah. quest for freedom. So it, it made sense that that, that path uh, would be continued in, um, in trying to find a material that would conjure that. And just by that, you know, I was able, fortunate that in the process of working, um, you know, how these marks are made with heat and patina liquid, the the handcuffs work because <laughs> they're metal. So they, they, yeah. they can uh, endure to, to, to sort of leave a, a, a sort of patina and a, a trace of themselves. Yeah. Um, well, uh, we're, they're telling us we just have a couple more minutes. Maybe just to wrap up, you know, um, if Sarah, could you go to the next image? Um, so this is a piece, Homeland, Sweet Homeland from 2012, and then also go to the next one, which is um, Fathers and Sons um, from 2010. You know, I think, you know, you mentioned, you know, the desire to take some of this history and some of this language and, you know, bring it to bear on the present. Um, and I think, you know, even for me, you know, I, I, you know, sometimes I talk about the timeliness of your work, but I think, you know, that's a little bit um, of a misconception because these ideas have been there since the very beginning, um, you know, the, the, and also, you know, the, especially with, you know, the issues around mass incarceration, um, about kind of systemic racism and about the kind of failure to look at that history within our country, you know, that, that has been a persistent theme of your work from the very beginning. Um, if we go back to Homeland, Sweet Homeland, um, I think this is a really, um, you know, amazing work that's in the um, collection of the Prez Museum um, that is, you know, rooted in um, your, uh, you and your brother's business card going back to the, the early 90s. Um, can, can you mind just ending on uh, maybe on that story and, and how this, you know, work came to be? Yeah, we you know. Well, my brother, he's a, he's a lawyer and you know, um, he used to work for Legal Aid at the time. And I, I remember on his business card, you know, he would have the citizens' rights on one side and, and his information, you know, information about content. And he would give it out to um, clients, you know. And, and so our, I thought that was really cool that he had this service connected to his introduction. So I, I decided I, I wanted to have a similar thing. So I just started putting my name on the back of, you know, the, the citizens' rights. And I would give it to friends. And the irony is when I would give it to certain individuals, mostly, people, you know, folks of color, they would feel as if I was accusing them of something or making them feel a little bit like, you know, they might need this, right? And I thought that was a problematic because they should know that this is their rights. This has nothing to do with culpability or guilt. This is something that they should be adamant about and, and yeah. um, very clear about preserving. And so I thought, okay, how can I re-represent that? So I decided I wanted, when I was doing a project with the Fabric Workshop, I decided I wanted to make a kind of sweeter version of it, like a home, home sweet home version, uh, a kind of crafty version. So I took the text and we decided to, to sort of make this version that is the citizens' rights, you know, um, notice the police officers, you know, and prosecutors, uh, and the, the, all the the, um, the things that you'd want for your rights, and put it in a, in a much more, uh, for me, it was making it uh, domesticated, you know, but it still had the edge, it still had the, the razor wires, still had the megaphones. Uh, uh, so that, that idea of pulling it back into this other space of the home and the domestic was really important to take it away from this space of feeling um, accusatory. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that's a beautiful, um, you know, uh, I think thing to remember and to strive for that, you know, 
the rights shouldn't be, you know, the rights that we share should not be provocative to state them. It should be as, you know, natural as, um, you know, as as the most you know mundane domestic thing in your your household, it should feel familiar and comfortable in a in a in a really important way. So, um, I, I don't want to go on. I think Sarah would love us for us to open the floor to some questions, but you know, thank you for answering all of my questions. And it's always um, a pleasure to talk to you even remotely. So, um, so Nora, you. I think you're going to come back in and um, and take a few questions from the chat. Yes, thank you both for such a riveting conversation. I could listen to you speak um, and share kind of context and background on these individual works for hours. Um, Neri, I wanna, before we, we get to the questions from, from the audience, I have one question that I am curious about, which is now this is the third stop on this exhibitions tour and you, you know, obviously there were years that went into planning it beforehand. So you've kind of been looking uh, and spending so much time with kind of your past, if you will, you know, kind of looking retrospectively at what you've made. I'm wondering how that's informed the work that you're making now and the projects that um, you're preoccupied with at the moment. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's been a, it's a, it's been a real, I guess, honor to have this, like, no, you know, it's a very rare thing that artists get to see so much of their work in one place and experience it. And so it's, it's been um, a, a strange rite of passage in that way, but it's also, like you said, it's kind of made me be more, um, I guess, hawkish about the future, right? <laughs> and, and, and what I decided is I just want to do work that I really enjoy because I work, it, it, you know, a lot of the work is really hard, you know, in terms of the hand and mm -hmm. being engaged with it. So I'm like, I just, I want to do work that I just get lost in. And I think that's, that's my key to, um, to what I get engaged with now, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like you asked what I'm working on, I'm, there, were, there was a body of work that I, I felt like it made me younger, right? This one body of work where I was going around collecting smiles in Harlem, you know, I was collecting, I was doing this smile and I'm like, it's time to start collecting some more smiles. So, you know, that, so I, those are the kind of, I, I feel like I need, I need to get back from the work again and that work did it. So I'm, I'm gonna be working on some more, my next project will definitely involve um, going out and meeting public and being uh, a, a smile collector. So we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're certainly generating a lot right now. Um, and I very much look forward to seeing that work. I think we could all probably use some of that joy um, in our lives. I want to remind um, our audience that if they have questions, to please share them in the um, comment chat function so that we can make sure to raise them to Gary and Neri. Um, I also want to, I mean, I have many um, other questions. So uh, while I have the opportunity, I'm just going to go ahead. Uh, I'm curious, uh, much of your work responds to the architecture that it's cited in there and um, changes and morphs. I mean, even just in the two examples of Amazing Grace that we saw, you know, it kind of reads, the experience reads and obviously feels different each time it's installed. Can you talk about how you kind of factor in the architecture and I'm kind of yeah, it's sort of both, since we did a big thing on our work of architecture here. <laughs> yeah, definitely, Nora. So I think from the day one, it's always been you, you take these humble materials that are overlooked and neglected and, and thinking about how they can occupy space and how they can become a room, how they can become a, a moment or an experience. So it's always about, and, and literally how they can become architecture in a way, right? And, and so it's always about how uh, how to engage with space. That which is so weird about, you know, I teach in the university and it's all done now remotely and I'm, how do you teach sculpture remotely? <laughs> you know, it's so much about space and, and about the things you can't see, but you conjure, right? And those are, that gets flattened out in the, in the stream. So I, I think that, you know, and when you approach me about, you know, the possibility of doing the We The People, at first I was a little bit taken on, on the, you know, David Age building. I was taken back and I said, no, this makes sense because I, those lace pieces were always about engaging with the architecture, right? It's always about how to just line this one string this one uh, kind of uh, moment get repeated and occupy space and how does your relationship to it change your reading of it? You know, like in all of those works, they're big for a reason, they're big 
so that if you're on the side, you may not even know what you're looking at, but depending on where you are, it becomes more legible. And for me, that's exciting. How you move changes the experience of the work. And that gets back to negotiating the space and architecture as well. It actually relates to the one of the first questions we have from Tamika. Um, can you speak a little more about the immersive quality of your work, which is obviously one of the key attributes, I think, that everyone responds to so emotionally and viscerally? Yeah, I, I the language of faith, but also the language of surface and material are what we're trying to play with and, and, and engage with the imagination, right? So I think that's the only way you, you can take this to another maybe poetic space and, a, and, a, and also a space that is more intersectional, that connects people with different experiences, right? You know, that language could never do. So I, I feel like material experience and, and you just try to push that as much as possible, you can pull the viewer into another kind of, um, and maybe even a, a, another kind of arena of how they see something or how they engage with something. You know, all of it is about, it's, it's basically, you know, like the child, Imagination muscle. You know, how do you work it out? How do you get it um, strong? And the stronger imagination is, the more people change and affect change in their own lives. And I think that's that gets to the activist space too. You know, so um, that's where it starts, though. I think if I'm, if I can add just a little bit. I, you know, one of the things that's been really special about Mary was actually getting to go to that. You know, your home now, your home and studio, but the firehouse. Like, you know, having that that amount of space to work and experiment at such a crucial point in your career and and you know being able to stay in that space must have i think i think it shaped your work in a lot of ways at least from from the outside yeah no i've been i've been lucky and i always um i have, I have a, a really great you know a, a nice space in, in harlem to work with but i also have uh a, a, like a, a very large basement that i have a lot of stuff stored in and i always say you know you know, I always have to openly say there's a lot of crying babies down there. You know, what I mean by that is when I go down there, there are things I collect that are, that are talking to me. Yeah. And it's just a matter of time before I pull them and start, you know, engaging with them. So it's exciting to have that, these crying babies around me so I can, um, you know, figure out what where they're going to take me. Are, are some of those crying babies, do they date back to the early 90s oh, when yeah. you first occupied oh, them? And it's more me being ready for them, you know, right. that, like how do you get the mind in that right space um, for them? And so, and I know they're calling me then. Yeah. So this, this time, this moment of pandemic has been really exciting. Cause, you know, I'm telling Gary, like, it's been great because I've been kind of going, it's actually not that much going back because there's more materials that I've had that are now I'm working with because I haven't been on the street as much. So it's, it's kind of exciting to, to sort of pull these, these conversations back out. Okay. Fantastic. Um, there's another question that I see from the audience from Sunboard Kiddo. Great name. Um, can you talk about the process of installing We the People on the side of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver? Is it still using shoelaces? If so, what was the process of collecting so many? Um, I hate. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's not. It's not. Um, so this is the banner piece, right? The the actual We the People uh, work. It is um, is not laces that I collected from individuals, you know. So there's a place. So I'm going to send out props to this one place. It's no longer, unfortunately, and the irony of this is this company went out of business because they couldn't compete with uh, the, the um, Asian market. There's a place called Laces for Less <laughs> that were nice enough. When, I, when they heard that I was looking for laces, and they were in Ohio and wonderful people. And they would send me all their rejects, all the laces that didn't work out, right? And all I had to pay, the guy was really great. He was like, oh, you know what? Just pay for the shipping. And so I sent uh, some some art, you know, to, to, uh, to, comp to compensate him. But the, uh, the great thing is I had, you know, just boxes and boxes of shoelaces um, from these laces for less. And um, unfortunately, they, they, they had to go out of business because they couldn't compete. So they're American-made rejects <laughs> that became part of the people. More information that you needed to know, but that's, <laughs> but no, it's actually important. And there's actually one, we the people, that, that are real coming from a public intervention. 
And that was um, one that I did, a site-specific one that I did for the Museum of, um, was it the Museum of- The Crystal right Bridges? No, right across from the Museum of Natural History, there is- Oh, the historical, New York's the historical New York society. society. Yeah. Right, they have it in their staircase. Um, and that was one, because they had an entire uh, year of programming around um, collecting laces from, mm -hmm. from their students to talk about citizenship. It was a, it was a year of citizenship. And so the, the piece became a way to, to talk about this idea of collecting, uh, I mean, connectedness through, through one mission. So that worked out really well. So that one in the New York Historical Society is, it's, um, and, but you know, it's not that, actually I say it, it is a strange one because you look and there are choices in there. I, I'm like, what, what color is that? There are just so many different kinds of, um, the range is much broader in, in that one. And I, I would- uh, Nora, one thing, ultimately yeah. when I got to the laces, it's twofold, there's twofold. It was really about, this anonymous mass that it, it, we know what these things are. We all have, have, have in some way had an experience with this, this shoelace, you know, it might even have been the first moment, that, you know, the first moment of tying, tying a shoelace. It's a Oh no. Neri, we may have lost you momentarily. I'm, I'm, I, can you hear me? No, yes, thank okay. you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Do you mind repeating so the last really thing? I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, I was just saying that the, the choice of the shoelaces was really key. The key choice reason was how it talked about our own experience and our own um, connected to connectedness uh, in some way, you know, like everybody, and, and also anonymous connectedness. Like it's, it's, mm. you know, shoelaces, anybody, you know, anybody, it's boy, girl, young, old, all of that. I think um, when we were install, just to clarify also the exterior installation uh, at MCA Denver is, is a um, kind of a facsimile of a picture of Neri's work installed. So it's actually vinyl that we apply to the exterior. Um, it's not shoelaces on the exterior. Um, and I personally love that in the kind of the contrast of the white vinyl and our, our dark glass, um, I don't know, the shoelace, the, the, the kind of texture of it or the, the form of it um, evokes almost tears to me or something that is uh, weeping. Uh, I, that was just kind of an unintentional, I guess, surprise, but it just speaks to the power of your work all the more that even in this kind of really unusual reinterpretation of it, um, it, it is as powerful and kind of breathtaking as the one that we have on the inside of the building right now. Yeah, the scale is really phenomenal. I, I really enjoy seeing that there. Uh, let's see, okay, we have maybe one more question um, from Amy. She's asking, Mary, can you talk about glory, your inspiration or interpretation? It's the, uh, the piece I keep coming back to after viewing the exhibition yesterday. Yeah, so thanks for asking about glory. Glory is, you know, I, so it, it, got, it goes back to me trying to tackle these big symbols, these kind of monolithic and, and, you know, so many people have done things with the American flag. I wanted to figure out how can I make the American flag mine? And my, my decision was that I, instead of only using it as an image, I could also think about it as a functioning object, as a refunctioning object. So the idea was, with Glory, was to create a tanning bed and so that you could tan the American flag on you. So it would actually, it actually would function uh, if you laid, if you were registered your body, you know, long enough on the table of it. Um, and so it was a, about the time that we had invaded Iraq and there was all this talk of us invading this, this other country for the oil. So oil was a real, and it still is a kind of charged material. So the oil barrels became the kind of um, structure for this flag that was gonna be tanned. But the, the, the one little quick narrative that really guided me um, you know, in, a, in a kind of a poetic way I'll never forget, I was looking through this magazine and I don't know what it was, 
in this magazine, they were selling tanning beds. And the name of this tanning bed that I saw was called Montego Bay. And Montego Bay is a city in Jamaica, right? And so, so I was like, oh, Montego Bay in Jamaica. And I realized that I started looking at researching tanning beds and almost all tanning beds have like third world, so-called third world destinations as their names. And so this tanning bed is this kind of so-called first world luxury item, right? So the idea of this, the mo it's the most useless object because it's a kind of a, th a third world, so-called third world uh, doing a, a sort of so-called first world function, which is to sort of have a tan. And most of these were in equator equatorial regions anyways. So it made it even more ridiculous. And I thought that's great that this thing, this is ridiculous because the more ridiculous it is, the more powerful it is as a kind of, um, in terms of meaning and, and being contrarian to expectation. Mm -hmm. So Glory had all these different trajectories that brought this one moment of um, having this tanning bit. That's wonderful. And all glory, the title, all glory, you know, and I just like that glory also has glow in it. So that's, this is all, this is how it all comes together. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, well, I think that is a wonderful moment uh, to conclude this incredible conversation on. I am so grateful to each of you for sharing these insights and observations and um, your amazing dynamic. And mostly, thank you for sharing this exhibition with us. It's, as I've said many times, it's been an honor to work with you and to now share it within our city. Um, I want to thank our audience for participating and for sharing great comments and questions and joining us. And please do uh, come back. Our uh, next kind of exhibition inspired program begins on July 21st. Uh, and there are many, many things subsequent to that. So in any case, thank you all for being here today. Mary and Gary, thank you again. And everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Great. Thanks, Gary. Thanks. 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 Bye-bye.